first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ann Doyle uh, for helping me out. I've been spending quite a bit of time down in the uh, Historical Society archive looking at pictures and listening to uh, oral histories that have been made by people. Um, and it's really nice that there's so many generous people that donate things to this historical society and people that categorize them and make them in ways that people can actually see them and, and use them. Um, I also am thankful to uh, my uh, wife's family. They happened to be down here in the early 1900s and took a number of films of the Breachway area. And so, although Tamar's father likes taking pictures of the ocean, uh, there's a lot of great pictures in there, and you're going to see some tonight, and I enjoy doing that. And in preparation for this uh, presentation, I was uh, also, on those winter nights, I was able to uh, uh, go on the internet and look at some resource materials that I didn't know were available, and I'm going to share some of those with you this, this evening. Um, looking through all these things, I'm, oh, I was very struck by the fact that Kwani has really changed a lot over time. As a matter of fact, if our grandparents came down, they may not recognize it uh, the way it is right now. And I was thinking, you know, may our grandchildren, when they come down, may not recognize the, the Kwani the way it was that we recognize. Um, I know uh, we live down in Ashaway Colony. I came down uh, many years ago, uh, let's see, 43, 44 years ago. I wasn't married then, and I came down to my wife's family's cottage uh, on Ashaway Colony. And um, I, reflecting back on that, I was surprised to look out the window and see every single house on our street has either been redone, remodeled, or added on to. And then I looked again and I said, of all the people on that street, the only people that are the same people are the people that are the nuns that are used in the nuns' place, and they change every year. <laughs> so in 45 years, I just remarkable how much change has happened in, um, in our neck of the woods. And then I thought, what would Tan Meyer's grandfather think if he came back and looked at the breachway uh, today? All the changes that have occurred there, some by nature and some by humans. Uh, her grandfather came down by train. We actually, Tamar's brother is really into trains in a big way. Um, and so we posed this question, Woody, how would uh, Grandpa Beach have gotten down to Kwani? And he had the train schedule. He'd taken an electric train to Bristol, I mean from Bristol, uh, Connecticut, to Hartford, a train to New Haven, and then a train to Westerly, and then horse and buggy to Kwani. Hello. Technology works really well when the Bluetooth tooth is connected. I will do it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> he also, it, her brother also mentioned this fact, which I thought was kind of interesting. That train ride from uh, New Haven to Westerly was kind of a new thing. The, the bridge that went over the Thames River was not completed till 1889, the train bridge that went over the Thames. And the Saybrook Bridge that spanned the Connecticut River was not done until 1870. So it gives you an idea of a lot of the traffic that occurred in this area was not by land, but it was by water. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Can hit the arrows so you can walk around? Oh, could you do that? Sure. Okay. Could you hit the area? Arrow, please. <laughs> so nature has had its toll on the on what the breachway looks like and what we look like. Um, the 1938 hurricane caused this kind of destruction, um, and the 54 hurricane and Hurricane Sandy probably did their share also, and really changed the shape of what the whole breachway looked like. This kind of thought in my mind, if this is what happened with the, in recent memory, what were the historic hurricanes and what destruction might they have caused to the uh, breachway, to the whole uh, Kwani Pond and whatnot? I found this study by Jeffrey Donnelly at Brown University. Um, he was interested in measuring how high the, um, the swell was after, after each, uh, in, during each hurricane. He did so by taking core samples 
in the earth. And he did so in the Succotash Swamp. And that's just, just uh, west of of Point Judith in Jerusalem, probably just south of the uh, Batuna Oyster House, if you've been there. Um, so he dug core samples out, and he identified these five Category 3 storms that were equal in intensity to the 1935 hurricane. Um, one of them was the great colonial hurricane of 1635, or 16... It should have been 16, yeah, 1635. There was the Great Connecticut Hurricane of 1638. And then, actually, they didn't call them hurricanes back then. They called them gales, because they hadn't invented hurricanes yet. And so you had the gale of 1815, and then we had the 1938 hurricane. If you could switch the slide. This is an interesting chart, because it shows how high the tidal surge was from each one of these storms. So here's 1938, right there. Look at the storms, and you can hit the button again, in 1935 and 38. These were over two feet higher than the tidal surge in 1938. So imagine the kind of destruction that would have been on the pond. Of course, there weren't all the buildings there, but certainly the Native American population must have been impacted by those two storms. The next great thing of the, that we did to change the breachway was the construction of the new breachway in 1961. Let's get it again. Here's a film from the beach collection of films showing that construction. I'm always impressed by the, how old the, the, uh, the machinery looks. And this was during my lifetime. Um, <laughs> this did a lot of interesting th things to the pond. It allowed more flow to come in and out of the pond, and it actually improved the quality of the Kwani Pond. Um, and as a matter of fact, it, it, I think the Kwani Pond may be one of the most, uh, um, the best health-wise of the salt ponds along the Rhode Island coast. It also allowed for traffic to be able to go uh, in and out from the pond to the ocean without a, is so much problem. There's a great oral history by Walter Nugent where he talks about um, coming down as a boy, his cottage was way out at the end, well I'll show it on the map when we get to it, um, of where the old breachway was. And what his job was as a boy was to go out in a boat and in the winter time try to find out where the breachway had moved over the winter. So that gives you an idea of how shallow that breachway and how movable it was. Uh, during, during that time, and this, this uh, certainly has changed the breachway quite a bit. Here's a picture of that breachway. Walter Nugent lived way out here. And this shows it's, it's the old and new uh, breachway. This is kind of the, the uh, plan that was used to sell the new breachway. Um, and instead of the, the, the breachway coming in and running west, it almost paralleled the coastline for a distance before going into the pond. It went straight in after it made that little dog leg in the beginning. A couple of other interesting things. This little place right here is the land that the king's cottage used to be on. And we'll show a picture of that. It used to be one of the places people stayed um, when they came down before the 38 hurricane. And of course, this gives all the names of people that lived along the street and how the land was, was broken up. So we can't talk about nature's impact unless we talk about the Ice Age, because the Ice Age really helped form the, the, the salt ponds, um, and it marked the beginning of uh, humans, humans in the area. Um, if you hit the slide. At the height of the Ice Age, the ice went out past Block Island. Right, right here, we'd be sitting under a huge block of ice. Uh, it wouldn't be very pleasant. Um, ocean level was 400 feet lower than it is today. It'd be nice with global warming if we could get back to some of that trend. Um, and in order to go out to the beach, you'd have to go out to the continental shelf here, which had been quite a ride from, from Kwani to get to the shore. Um, next slide. As that receded, as the ice receded, it left debris. One important area of debris was the 
what we call the Charleston Moraine. It was a terminal moraine. It was the end of the ice ages that retreated. It left a pile. That's the way, if you went north from Route 1, you would, and biked up that hill, you'd have to dr download your, your bike into a loader, lower gear in order to get the, up the, the Charleston Moraine. What happened south of that was there was a huge tidal or uh, shore plain that was worked and reworked by uh, her, with uh, storms, tides, and currents, and it formed the salt pond that's Kwani along the, the shore as well as the other ponds. Um, next slide. So about, this, this, this number kind of blows my mind, about 12,000 to 10,000 years ago, the first humans arrived here. They, we have archaeological evidence of them actually having camps where they lived that are in areas now that are underwater. So it gives you an idea of how early they were here. Um, it would be a fascinating uh, to find more information about this time in history. I, I've read a few things online and a few books, but it certainly it would be nice to have somebody knowledgeable come give a talk on this important uh, history. But I know in the Quantiquantog area, there have been evidence of a lot of uh, Indian artifacts found by people. And uh, when they've dug um, foundations for houses, they often came, come across uh, uh, mittens, what they call, or, or what Indian, uh, well, how do we put this, I Indian uh, um, outhouses. And they're very distinct because they have shells on them, so you can see them. And so we know they were out on the Kwani, Kwani Pond, the Kwani uh, area. We also, um, uh, Alan Hazard just gave a presentation a, um, this, this summer where he talked about wampum and its cultural significance to the Indians um, and talked about his uh, ancestors living in this area and how they um, fished and uh, got shellfish in the area. Um, and stayed here for at least nine months of the year, only retreating farther inland during the, the harsher winter months. Um, there's a couple of other good books, and I've got to read my notes here in order to get to this. Oops. Uh, there's a couple of really good books. Uh, there's one by uh, a William Cronin called Changes in the Land. Indians, Colonists, and the Oncology of New England. Um, and he talks about how, how much the land had been changed before Europeans arrived here. It talks about the, the evolution of that change. Um, Indians would burn off underbrush. They would farm. Uh, Indian uh, Native American farming was different than the colonists in that they would plant an area, and when it went fa fa fallow, they would go into a new area and plant. Colonists were very much interested in their own private land, and so they kept on working the same plot of land, and the only way they could keep growing crops on it was to add some nutrients, and so they used seaweed. But it was that idea of keeping things in a very uh, uh, property-oriented fashion. Uh, colonists also brought with them a livestock, which, which Native Americans didn't do, and that required the use of fodder for the winter so that seagrass was really important, and that's why these areas around here are so important. So there's some interesting differences. But here's, this is by uh, uh, a couple of folks from the anthropology department at UMass, and they talk about the different stages of Native Americans here. That gives you a little idea of what, what they were doing in, at different times. Again, I'd like to study this area more. It really is a fascinating part of history. So then we had Europeans arriving. This is a, a map that was um, done by Adrian Block in 1613, 16, something, 1614, after his second voyage to, the, to uh, our area. Uh, he was one of the first European explorers that actually went up into the Narragansett Bay um, and was, uh, established trade routes with Native Americans all along the southern coast of Rhode Island and Connecticut. And he has a distinction of identifying Long Island as an island. And probably more important, he has this little island off the coast named after him. Um, what's interesting on this, and you can't see it, I wish I could have gotten a 
higher resolution from the, the, uh, the Library of Congress where I found this. But right here, where we are, it says Wampanoags. It identifies the Native American tribe, which was probably referred to Wampanoag. So by 1814, they were already trading, because these maps were made after the fact, uh, in this area that the Dutch were. Um, the other thing is interesting to notice, it's New Netherland, and no notice what they claim as being New, New Netherland. Um, if it wasn't for uh, a few battles lost, uh, we might be called New Netherland rather than New England. Um, <coughs> Here's another Dutch uh, early map of the area. This is also interesting because look at the yellow. That's the area the Dutch were in control of. And the green part, which is what the English were. So notice it's changed a little bit, but even in this, at this date, 1639, they still were claiming uh, most of Rhode Island. Um, the Dutch had a strong relationship to this area um, because they, they were barterers. The English liked to deal with cash, so transactions were done with money. And the Dutch were very comfortable with dealing with, with product back and forth. So, you know, you have a cow, I've got a bale of hay, uh, I'll give you 60 bales of hay for a cow. And they were comfortable with that, where the English wanted to use money. Um, and that was really important for the colonists that were English during the English Civil War, um, because the Dutch were able to keep them supplied with materials in exchange for other materials. The, um, the Rhode Islanders were, um, um, <clears throat> were not as, they were liberal, I guess. They were Quakers versus um, in the Massachusetts Bay co uh, Colony, they were more Puritan and more authoritarian in their rule. And um, so the, the, the uh, Rhode Islanders were much more comfortable dealing with the Dutch, which were much more liberal-minded than with dealing with the, the people from the Massachusetts Bay Company. So here's another map. This is kind of important because this is, uh, notice the change in color. I think that river there is the, the, the Thames in Connecticut. I think that is. Um, the Wampanoas is still the Indian tribe that's, or Native American tribe that's here. Um, and this is what's in 1690, a few years after um, we have the Stantons arriving in the area. Um, there were several things that occurred um, with, when the English started settling the area. They, had, they purchased a large tract of land um, from the native population, which encompassed most of uh, Westerly. It was called the Musquamacut pur Purchase, and it was done by 30 families from Newport. And if I'm really good, I'll give you the date on that. That was in 1660. In 1659, another Stanton was given all of the area we're on right now, um, and it was part of uh, a thank you from the Sachem of Ninigret because um, it was the the Stanton was uh, was able to speak the native languages, and he was able to negotiate for the release of a princess from another tribe, and um, so in return for that the tribe gave him the Kwani neck. Um, and the Stantons have been on this neck um, for all through the 17th century um, and had a, um, farms on the neck. Whistling chimneys. Uh, we talk about this is, this is one of those farms. This is kind of interesting because it was credited as, as maybe being a trading post. The Stantons set up a trading post, or they had the rights to set up a trading post on the Pawcatuck River. They also think they had some trading going on on the Kwani Pond, but there's no hard evidence to say, yes, definitely there was. There is some early Dutch tiles that are in whistling chimneys that show that uh, that, that time it could have been some sort of trade. They could have gotten that way. And we also know, you'll learn a little bit later, that the breachway may have been of, of uh, service to having that be considered the, um, um, the, a trading post. Um, there are, along the side here, Anne has put together some great 
uh, display boards. And there's some of that, um, which, where is the one here? The Stanton Babcock, way over in the corner there, of, the, of um, this particular house and something about it, the history of it, with additional pictures, which are kind of interesting. Next one. This is another farm. This farm is still in existence. As you travel down West Peach Road, it's on the left. Um, just before the, turn, the road takes a turn to go out towards the breachway. Um, this is kind of an interesting farm because I believe this was owned by a man that when he uh, passed away, his, in his will, he gave, it was credited in his estate that he had 40 horses and as many slaves. Um, which is kind of the dark side of the, the Kwani neck in that each one of these farms, these two, plus the Seabreeze Inn, which was also a farm, all had slaves. In fact, on the Seabreeze Inn, if you look on that display board, it shows the design for the slave quarters um, at the farm. Um, so these were the, the three farms that were on the neck and were passed, their land was divided and passed down uh, from generations and has been in, in um, members of the family. The, the, the Sheffield House, for example, which is Stanton Sheffield House, which is the one we had just seen, was, um, was given to a son-in-law of, uh, of a Stanton. All right, this is uh, Thomas Jeffers. Uh, this is the first English map of the area. What's interesting about this is the first one I could see a mention, I believe, of Quantum Tog. Of course, they spell it funny. Um, and it also shows a little breachway. So it almost seems like that there was a breachway. People knew that there was a breachway at this time. But that was in 755, 1755. So what did it look like down here? Well, I posed this question to a good friend, Peter Mogelnicki, and he mentioned, wow, have you seen some of the artwork of Martin Johnson Hetty? And so I went online and looked, and I found these, there's two pictures. There's this one. What did the salt marshes look like uh, at that time? And so this gives an idea. Now, he was, he was a little later, about 1850, he did these paintings, but it gives an idea of what it looked like. We didn't. We didn't have all those photographs that we can use back in that time. Gives you a little idea of what the area might have looked like. So I was uh, sitting watching television one night, and I have to multitask when I watch television, and I was wondering, there, there's this big mystery about there being a third breachway, direction for a breachway. We know the one that was changed in 61, but there was one before that. And I've listened to some of the oral histories, and it's, maybe it's my comprehension of listening, but I was never able to figure out where those breachways went. And I was thinking, oh, can I go to town records? What can I do to find out where that breachway went? And I was on, for some reason, on the Library of Congress website, and I saw a section called Ancient Maps. And I went and found this nautical chart from 1848. Now the nautical chart's a huge area of Rhode Island, and I blew up just a section around Kwani. But look, and it shows the old breachway. And look where it goes. Here's Whistling Chimneys right here. And that breachway goes almost right to Whistling Chimneys, doesn't it? Next. So there's Whistling Chimneys. We can switch past that. So here's the, the um, nautical chart of 1878, and I believe I picked that one because, oh yes, this was the time that Thomas Edison in Kwani decided it would be a great way to produce iron ore by using magnets and extracting iron out of the sand. And um, so he had an operation going. I think I was told that it was near the Stanton Sheffield house his plant was, and it was off in the East Beach, uh, the Central Beach areas where he had set up his plant, but I can't, I'm not sure on that. Um, but I was surprised to hear it was a thousand tons of iron ore was sent out of Quantiquantog before he shut the operation down because there were cheaper ways of making iron. Um, but I thought it was interesting that a, someone like Thomas Edison would have been uh, coming to Kwani. And then the next slide. 
So this slide is really, it's a little fuzzy, but I want you to take a very close look at the breachway and then look at the next slide. So in 1886 to 1887, something dramatic happened to that breachway. So again, using the miracle of technology, I went online and looked at weather forecasts, and the blizzard of 1886, or 18, yeah, 1886, um, dumped an incredible amount of snow on the New England had extremely high winds, extremely low temperatures, and caused tremendous erosion along the coastline. So it may be, I don't know for a fact, but it seems like it might be logical that that's what did that to the breachway. Um, it's either that, or that the need for that breachway wasn't uh, important anymore. Um, because they had now other ways of transporting goods besides using uh, the water in the coastline. Um, and it maybe they just didn't, didn't dig the, uh, the breachway. The old breachway looks like it had to be dug because of the angle it was at. It seems like someone had to maintain it. And there is some talk about when they talk about this older breachway of having to go out and do some digging. Uh, in some of the oral histories they talk about, uh, talking about grandfathers saying that they had to go out and, and maintain the breachway. So that one might make some sense. The next one. Now this is kind of an interesting one because there's roads now going out to the, the, the breachway, actually down to the breachway. And this was actually the time that there were cottages built along the shore. In fact, in what was it, 1888, there were 14 cottages built along the breachway. In 1893, there were several more cottages added, including a short dining hall that, over, uh, that offered overnight accommodations. Um, so that's, uh, this is the map that, Kurt, that uh, kind of shows the roadways that you needed to get down there. Hope Andrews has a great DVD on West Beach where she talks a little bit about this history uh, that was available with the uh, Historical Society. And maybe if there was interest, we could make a few more copies. But, um, that shows the development of the breachway. So what did it look like back then as the breachway was being uh, built? I love this picture. It's an old picture taken from whistling chimneys towards the breachway. So we're actually looking towards the, the, the breachway. This may be um, one of the bowling alleys. Um, but what's interesting is seeing the stone walls harken back to two programs ago when we had a program on stone walls, and you see cattle grazing in fields. And again, this was a source of great, uh, the uh, salt grass was very uh, useful for um, feeding cattle and grazing. And it almost looks like there's more land there than there is now. It looks like there's, some of that has been filled in by water. Um, and what is amazing is the vegetation, how low the vegetation is uh, versus what it is now. Um, a whole different perspective. I love that picture. So this is uh, an important picture because of the life-saving station. Um, their, uh, ship, shipping was really the mode of transportation along the coastline. And there were a tremendous number of um, shipwrecks along the coast. Um, there was actually a great um, program by Dwight Brown, which is available in the oral histories, uh, that talks about the shipwrecks and the names of them. Unfortunately, it was a recording of a presentation he made, and I'd love to see the pictures he also was showing. But it's, uh, it's just hearing all the shipwrecks and, and how the, the life-saving station was important um, in saving lives along the coastline. Here's a picture of the mouth of the breachway, the early mouth of the breachway, just about the time that Coast Guard Station was being put in. Um, notice that it would be very easy to walk across that breachway compared to what it is now. So the breachway was developed and had several guest houses or hotels along the beach. Uh, 
the Elbridge House, the Ocean View, the Worcester House, the Breakers, the St. George. Around the corner was the King's Cottage. Um, and so what's remarkable about this is the density of people that were on the breachway at this time. So let's take a little bit closer look at some of these places. Here's the King's Cottage. Uh, I've, this is the one that's right in the middle of the current breachway we have. Notice a stone wall along here that was used to hold back the water. Clearly this was one of the first places to go in the 38 hurricane, given the low-lying position. Um, it was almost a, had a bullseye on it, um, but uh, that was the King's Cottage. And then we have the Eldridge House. Um, here's an early picture of the Eldridge House. Again, look at all those people that are there. Here's a later picture of the Eldridge House. Notice they had put, put uh, porches on the front of the, uh, the cottage. This is a view from across the breachway at the Eldridge. And in back of the Elbridge House, they put in a bowling alley and also, I believe, a, a, a garage. I think they... So the Eldridges were very well-connected uh, family. Uh, there's a great oral history by one of the Eldridge, or the ancestors of the Eldridge in the Historical Society. And you may have a lot of people coming down to the Historical Society in this presentation. Um, but it talks about the Eldridge. They were avid Democrats. Um, <laughs> and they would hold the Democratic um, picnic once a year at the Eldridge House. And so it was a big event. People, a lot of people came down to Quantic and talk for that. Um, so this was, uh, and it, there was a, kind of the story that he supported some, I can't think of the governor's name, some governor, and that governor then gave him the postmastership of Ashaway. Um, Bradford. My oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great story. It's a great story. Was that? And, and my grandfather used to do, um, um, they had all kinds of, of people come down from New York, but and they're all on that porch. And it was always a problem he had because it was going to the water. <laughs> because there were so many people on the porch. Oh. It didn't collapse. <laughs> Now, have you done an oral history? No. I, I'm the third generation of this. I just have learned it since I moved back to Connecticut from Connecticut and learned all about it through Ann and everybody. And so I, okay. I, I'm not, uh, I'm picking up lots of information. You, so this is a, a little plug for oral history if you haven't done one. Every oral history, although there's the same topic, hit something else. It's, now I've listened to a number of them. So you listen to one, and then you listen to someone else who lived next door, and it's like a whole different place, because they have a whole different perspective, because they've heard stories from other people. Um, so... Did they talk about the plant that they Yes. Oh, I didn't hear that. Oh, I think I have, may have pictures if I can find them. And? <laughs> right she knows where I am. Okay. <laughs> but it, you know, that just popped into my head. No, everybody's heard her say that. <laughs> you no, know, every time I come, I learn something you new. Know, so. Great. That's wonderful. The, the other place, which I didn't find out a lot about, was the Breakers. Um, the Breakers were, was owned by a farmer, Clark, um, who also ran this. Um, the one thing I heard reoccurring in the uh, oral histories was that this was a place you went that was dry. They didn't have alcohol. They didn't serve alcohol. Now, whether that meant that at the Elbridge House you could get out alcohol during Prohibition, I don't know. I, I didn't find out. Rich, Rich, look at the difference in the number of people on the porch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, good point, Rich. <laughs> okay, this is the St. George. Again, I didn't find much out about the St. George. Um, and so if somebody has a story about the St. George, that would be great. I know that the, the boardwalk ended just past the 
uh, St. George. Um, next slide. So here's a picture from the breachway of the breakers, the Worcester, the, boy, this is really, I'm doing this from memory. This gets really hard. The Ocean House. Oh, and the Eldridge. Thank you. I did that. So, and there's one more. Can someone tell me what the, the other one is in the picture? King's Cottage, yes. The King's Cottage, way there on the lower on the ground. Um, here's a peak picture of the breachway. Um, I love this picture because you can see how shallow the water was. I also love this picture. Um, this was a time in history where they hadn't discovered the, the bikini, the one piece, or bathing trunks. <laughs> Uh, it seems like if you uh, went swimming, you had to be properly attired. Uh, and this picture is kind of interesting because this is the entrance to that boardwalk, which we'll see on the next slide in just a few minutes, that comes from the east side. So this is coming around the point of the breachway. And uh, so that's the beginning of the boardwalk. And the next page are pictures from the boardwalk. This is taken from the boardwalk looking back into the pond. There's King's Cottage. Here's a picture taken from that boardwalk now looking out to sea. Love that ship. And this is a really interesting picture. This is the boardwalk, and notice how close it comes to the porch. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine that happening in this day and age. <laughs> What, what I heard from a lot of the oral histories talking about this time, they would use the word, this is the time of togetherness, where there was a feeling of togetherness across, across the uh, breachway, or a sense of community. People would go strolling on the boardwalk at night and stop in at people's houses, talk to them as they're rocking in their rocking chairs on the, the boardwalk. And once that boardwalk was gone, all of a sudden there became walls on every property and people didn't go across and, and so they lost that sense of community. It was more about private property, um, which was kind of interesting. It's uh, a, total, a total different feel and change in, in community. Because there were so many people that lived along the breachway, they could support um, different businesses. Here's Mother Brindley's, Brindley's and uh, I think we've you've had programs on that before, I believe. Um, but that was a kind of the convenience store in, in uh, Kwani, and Mother Brindley, well, I guess, was quite the character. Um, and then there was Wilson's Ice Cream Parlor. No relation. No relation to Bill. <laughs> uh, but we have ice cream tonight anyways. Um, and there also was a bowling alley at the Wilson's uh, um, Ice Cream Parlor. Uh, here's a picture of the lifeguard, lifeguard uh, station. And what people did as an amusement or as, as an entertainment is they go for a tour at the lifeguard station. So they, if you hit it again, they'd go by King's Cottage. They would get in a boat. They'd paddle across. These are liberal women. <laughs> And they'd go out for a walk at a some time at the Coast Guard station. Great, right, next. Now, does anyone have any stories about this? So, supposedly, there was a high dive at Quantum Talk. I kind of like this picture. Um, I like this young lady who's sitting down here looking up at the gentleman, and I. I have to wonder what she's thinking. <laughs> it's either, I didn't have insurance back then. So it's either, you know, wow, look at that brave man, or that stupid dummy. <laughs> so, and they had bowling alleys. This is uh, the bowling alley in two iterations. This is the, the Eldridge. And then it, this is also it and a renovation. Upstairs, the people worked, that worked there slept and they had half, half 
I can remember the half of the walls, and then the, the front has the, the store. Oral history of someone who lived up there. Uh, yeah. Del Harmon. Del Harmon. She's here tonight. Del, are you? Where's Del? There's Del. Yes, a great oral history. So it'll be great that you should uh, listen to that. Talks about life up on the top of the bowling alley. Um, so this is what life was like at the bowling alley. Click it again. I love the garb that people wore. Yes. These, these are all relatives of my uh, uh, wife, Tamar. What year was this? Uncle Harry. Uncle Harry. This has to be in the 20s, would you say, Tamar? Yeah, I love the pants. Don't you wish they, those came back? <laughs> this was open in the 50s. As a kid, I used to go down and hold it. This was on the same film as a boardwalk. So. And some of the same characters. <laughs> There's a picture here up there, the, the someone changing the pins and letting their feet down. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many people here have changed pins at the bowling alley? Yeah. Close to next to a nickel to have somebody do the pins for us. <laughs> Was that destroyed in the 38 no. 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 yeah. yeah. oh, hour day? No. And smoking was still healthy back then. Yes. Put up a So when did it come down? It was open in the 60s. I was going to say, because I remember buying Medicaid there, and I was born in 61. In the 60s, okay. Yeah. And that's the side of where the tennis courts are. Right, where the tennis courts right are. Right so right where the tennis courts are now or where the bowling alley was. All right, next slide. So there are other forms of entertainment. I don't know where this cottage is. If you know, please let us know. Gives an idea of what it must have been like walking down there. And then there's these really impressive feats of strength. <laughs> Look at this guy, one-handed, heck. I don't think he had children, did he? <laughs> and then this is my favorite. Now this is an adult activity that you do at the beach. <laughs> so I guess the question is now, what will the, the uh, uh, nature and humans do to uh, shape the breachway of the future? Um, and then I have this mystery film. Um, does anybody know who this is? This, this, the person that owned this, this canoe. So the br Tamar's brother's in the hat, and I think Tamar's there too. Yeah, I, I never, yeah, I didn't wear a top. <laughs> <laughs> the story is he would come down from Maine, and he would take his canoe and go out and do the canoe thing. Mm -hmm. And he
So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.